Philip Guston, sometime disciple of the Mexican muralists, admirer of Beckman and de Chirico, found himself trapped in a false position. His beautiful, informal brush marks taken to be the quintessence of art for art's sake. Already in 1960, he was articulating his discomfort. There's something ridiculous and miserly in the myth we inherit from abstract art, that painting is autonomous, pure, and for itself. But painting is impure. We are image makers and image ridden. In these same years, a younger generation rose in open rebellion against Abex, initially under the umbrella of pop. Guston condemned the soulless commercialism of early pop art, and de Kooning, when he met Warhol, burst out, you're a killer of art, you're a killer of beauty, you're even a killer of laughter, I can't bear your work. <laughs> the strange, painful transition made by Guston in the years 1965 to 67 will be explored uh, in detail later. After many years of abstraction, he re-emerged in his hooded clansmen, his heaps, his smoking and drinking selves, as the great serio-comic carnivalesque painter of the second half of the 20th century. The comic strip visionary Robert Crumb felt the affinity. It was as though we'd both tapped into this great grungy unconscious, all the unconscious imagery of lower middle class America. Just as the tragicomic art of Goya and Gilray was a corrective to the hegemony of neoclassical taste at the end of the 18th century, so the grotesque hilarity of such paintings as painting, smoking, eating in the 1970s broke in upon cool American formalism, whether of the Greenbergian or the Warholian variety. The scandal of Guston's later canvases was that they came not from some young marginal, but from one of the Abex masters. In 1953, when de Kooning first exhibited his woman's series, there had been a shock response the woman one was swiftly purchased by the Museum of Modern Art. But in 1970, on the night Guston at last exhibited his new imagery at the Marlborough Gallery in New York, the outrage was far greater. De Kooning was one among the few to approach him, saying, you know, Philip, what your real subject is, it is freedom. The fortress of formalist abstraction had been so reinforced and armored over the previous two decades that any effective challenge had to come from inside. For Guston, the immediate consequences were catastrophic. The Marlborough Gallery dropped him, and he found himself excommunicated as a traitor and a heretic. They said I was finished. Some painters of the abstract movement, my colleagues, friends, contemporaries, refused to talk to me. For several more years, Guston had difficulty exhibiting or selling. With hindsight, it is obvious that standing, smoking, eating, paintings, smoking, eating, could only have been created by an artist steeped in the scale and handling of American abstraction. The other new varieties of figuration that emerged after 1960 often had abex buried somewhere in their foundations. The ambition, the seriousness, the sense of the tragic, all carried over into history painters as various as R.B. Kitai and Leon Golub, Ida Applebrug and Anselm Kiefer. Yet almost all the artists that he goes on to discuss were motivated by a need to challenge the exclusionary and restrictive ideology constructed around abstract expressionism. Guston's quest to tear off the mask of abstraction became a paradigm for a new generation from the 1980s onwards. 